The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. We are the 99%. That was the chant in 2011 that helped put the issue of rising income inequality into the global zeitgeist. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. This week, we'll look back on a few of the significant events of the past decade as we cover people raising their voices in search of change. Tonight, Occupy Wall Street. In September of 2011, protesters in New York City took to the streets and occupied a park in the financial district to oppose growing social and economic inequality. The movement came to be known as Occupy Wall Street, and it helped to frame the conversation around income inequality and about the influence of money in politics around the world. Economic populism then became a central theme of the 2016 U.S. presidential election that set the stage for Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton. Calls for a higher minimum wage is one of Occupy's lasting victories. The leaderless structure of Occupy has since been seen in other grassroots movements, such as Black Lives Matter. Here's our conversation from October 2011, when protesters were still occupying Wall Street. Kobe, I want to start with you since you're right in the thick of this thing. The financial crisis that is supposedly the foundation of all of these protests uh, is uh, three years behind us already. Uh, people did not take to the streets then the way they are now. So why is this happening now? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I think that a general uh, answer for that is the inspiration that we have uh, from Egypt, from Tunisia, from, other, uh, from Israel, from other countries. And that kind of uh, gave a backwind for, for the undercurrent situation in this country. So people uh, saw that it's possible, although there there is a completely different situation. Uh, but we here trying to fight a different tyranny, the tyranny of the corporate. And it just gave us uh, more inspiration that it's possible and people can just come to the street and engage in the political process again and try to restore democracy and fight corruption. Do I understand this right, Kobe, that Americans are being inspired by demonstrators in the Middle East, and that's why I, it is happening here? I, I, I personally believe so. Uh, the, the problem, as you said, the problem were there three years ago, so why now? Because for so many Americans, millions of Americans have been watching what happened in Egypt and what happened in Tunisia, and that kind of show that, uh, oh, and other countries and other people fighting for the rights and what's going on here, why we are not fighting. And you know, it started very small. I remember the first, the second day we were 40 people uh, going on Wall Street mm -hmm. and two weeks later we were 30,000. So that means that the, the, the spirit is here. We just need to catalyze it and, and mobilize more people. Okay, let me get Todd on that. He, he's quite right. This started out as something that certainly was portrayed in mass media as being rather insignificant and it's way bigger now. What's changed? Well, let me, I have a second reason why I think it's happening now. I, I, I completely agree about the inspiration of the uh, demonstrations and the overthrows in the Middle East. I think also, if Obama had lost the 08 election and John McCain had been president, this might well have happened two years ago. I think that uh, a number of the people I've talked to in the park have actually were in Boston equivalent, which I just came back from, uh, actually were involved in the 08 election, had high hopes, probably stratospherically, absurdly high about what Obama would accomplish, gave him the benefit of the doubt, more or less went back to normal, and then now, only now that he sort of worn out his welcome with the left, has they, have they felt liberated to uh, do what they're doing. Okay, Betsy, let me put this follow-up to you then. For, for those that are in the thick of this thing, and by that I mean the demonstrators, I mean people in the Twitterverse, people in social media, this is a very big deal, and this flame looks like it's burning very brightly. But put it into context, in terms of where kind of most of middle America is today, is this as big a deal for them? Well, I think it's pretty remarkable that uh, there was just a poll yesterday that was taken comparing uh, mainstream American support for Occupy, the Occupy movements and the Tea Party. And Occupy received twice as much support from everyday Americans. 
Now, that's not to say that that you know a lot of people who feel rage at what's happened in this country about you know the the the, the loss of the American dream and um, their sort of frustration with the economy. They're not the same people necessarily as those that are camped out down in Zuccotti Park, but um, they still have a tremendous amount of sympathy for what these protesters are doing. Let me get you on that same thing, Janet. How do you gauge how long the tentacles of this thing are into sort of Mr. and Mrs. Everyday America, Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Canada? Well, I think that, um, I mean, as others have said, this uh, eruption didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it has, I think it has long roots. I think what we're seeing here is a convergence of many grievances, many activisms, many struggles uh, that are not just in the United States, that are actually very widespread internationally. Uh, I think also, uh, I mean, I would say that this is a reappearance of the activist generation that we first saw uh, in Seattle. And uh, so this with is 20 years ago, anti-globalization. Well, it's you know it's what it's 12 years ago. Uh, well, that was much. that was percolating uh, uh, in the 1990s before it erupted so visibly in 1999. But I think we see this very similar modes of protest and organizing here. A very strong um, leadership by uh, predominantly white student and youth movements initially, uh, very strongly motivated by values of autonomism, self-organizing, self-management, participation, participatory democracy, a strong critique of representative democracy as it's functioning, uh, and also a strong conviction that um, you know, the key to uh, both a democratic future, but also I think a sustainable and survivable future is the fact that people have to take things back into their own hands. Let me pick up on two words you just said there, representative democracy, and David put this to you. They have chosen to occupy a park, a private park for that matter, in New York City. They have made Wall Street their primary target. But if unhappiness with representative democracy is a part of all of this, why isn't this happening on the Mall in Washington, or why isn't this happening in front of the White House, or something like that? Well, that's one of the most intriguing parts of all of this. That is to say that these young activists are, in a fundamental sense, throwing back a challenge even to governmental powers by way of saying, you're in the pockets of Wall Street. You do the bidding of corporate power and the banks in this country. You just bailed them out to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars of their losses, and now you're cutting our health care. Now you're cutting our education. We're looking at Mick Jobs for our future. So in fact, in many ways, this is part of the innovation of this movement, that they're saying just demonstrating outside government is not enough. We're going to the sources of real financial corporate power in this country, the people who call the tunes of our politicians. And in that way, they're rewriting the script of what popular protest is all about in a really interesting and exciting way. I want to make a point about the geography of this mm -hmm. movement because, I mean, number one, it started with this call to occupy Wall Street, which is incredibly symbolic. But there was also almost instantaneously a taking up of that call to occupy in a very decentralized way. So, I mean, I checked Mother Jones' site this morning, and there are 190 Occupy sites now worldwide, the vast majority of them at the moment in the U.S., 190. And I think one of the most powerful things about the dynamic that's underway is that people are being invited to occupy public space in the communities where they live. It's not about Washington. Although, by the way, there is a big Occupy uh, effort happening right now in Washington. Hmm. And it's where a pre-organized, um, a pre-planned protest around war spending and the bailout has now converged into the Occupy movement. And they're now calling themselves Occupy whatever it is, Washington Plaza or whatever it's called. But I mean, they're not, not in Washington. It's just that they're also in many other places. And that's what's really, really dynamic about this. And it's also, it preserves this movement from being prematurely shut down. Betsy, how widespread do you believe the view in the United States is that essentially the American presidency, the American Congress is bought and paid for by big corporations and real folks don't have a shot? Well, I think it's it's pretty widespread. I mean, if you the, the 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 level of support that the Congress gets. I mean, we always hear about how Obama is, you know, tanking in the polls, but but actually there's a very very American people hold the Republican Congress in very very low regard at this point. Um, there's just not a lot of hope that Washington is going to deliver on its promises. Um, whether you, you you're, you're thinking about the Tea Party or the Democratic Party. So I think in that way, this was uh, Occupy Wall Street was a really brilliant choice of target. 
because people had really begun to understand that, that the system was broken and at the root of it, as Todd pointed out, is, is Wall Street, is, is the, the top 1% and how their priorities through the whole system of campaign contributions, which was accelerated, unfortunately, by the Supreme Court decision in, in Citizens United. Um, and, and there's a sense among, you know, activists, professional activists, the so-called professional left, that there's really not a lot that can be do accomplished in Washington. Betsy, the protesters say, though, we are the 99 percent. In other mm -hmm. words, everybody, not, not the 1 percent in America who's got all the money, we're the other 99 percent. And I wonder, based on what you're seeing in the square, Betsy, um, you know, how accurate does that reflect who's actually occupying Wall Street these days? Well, I mean, the interesting thing is it's growing, right? And it's spreading, as we've noted. It's all over the country. It's also, last Wednesday, we saw a, a massive demonstration where many, many unions and community organizations came out and turned out. So um, I, I think it's really expanding. I would like to make one point to, to, on the question of the relationship of this protest to government. I think there is, as Janet pointed out, a really well-founded skepticism of the current political institutions that we have. On the other hand, government is, the, is really the only means we have to confront the power of the financial sector. It's the only, the, right now, as we talk, the, the, those very 1% forces in Washington are trying to gut the Dodd-Frank financial regulation. The, the only way we can possibly redistribute wealth in this country is by using the levers of government. So um, I think that, you know, I mean, not to sound like a big government liberal, but, but, but I think that we can't lose sight of, of the importance of reclaiming our government well, let's for hit, this cause. Let's hit it on the head here. Kobe, are you calling for a revolution? We call in for a revolution, but more in a system shift manner, not in a, you know, upside down. Uh, we, w we do want a significant change uh, in, in the political structures, in the economic structures, and in our education structure. If that called revolution, so we'll call it revolution. But in my own opinion, we, we truly want you know, to deal with the social issue, to deal with the environment, to deal with the wars, to deal with, with the marginalized community. And if we need to create different systems or shift the system that are existing, we, are, we hopefully will do that in the coming hmm. uh, months and years. David, I'm not suggesting they're calling for a Marie Antoinette off with their head revolution, but are they, in your understanding of that word, calling for a revolution? Well, I think in important senses, yes. But we need to understand that this is a new left in the making. Mm -hmm. Since the global financial crisis of 2008, the political terrain has shifted dramatically. This is part of a global youth revolt. It has been taking place in the streets of Spain, in the streets of Greece, in Tunisia and Egypt. It's happening right now in Chile with a massive student upheaval. This is something that's happening globally. And as millions of young people mobilize and start to create new movements, they create also new political methods, new political organizations, new visions. And the vision which they're developing has a lot of revolutionary implications. But it's not going to look like the old revolutionary movements of different periods of time. This is a new era with a new way of inventing politics and creating a new left that speaks to our time not based on perhaps outdated and outmoded models. And so, yes, there is something revolutionary about it, but at the same time, it, this, is, it, this is the birth pangs. That's why it's so unfair in some ways to say, is it representative of everybody yet? Well, it's a lot more representative than Wall Street, I'll tell you that. <laughs> or to say, could you run everything this way? Mm -hmm. That's not the question yet. The question is, is it possible for a movement like this to start to redefine what serious, popular, democratic politics might look like for a new era. Okay, given that question, Todd, how would you answer the question that David McNally just put? I'm sorry, could you restate that question? Well, if it's not exactly to replace Congress, but rather it is the beginning of a conversation to kind of deal with the issues that Congress should be dealing with, but doesn't because it's too corrupt, in their words, can they claim some victory on that? Well, the fact that we're having this discussion and that this is a dominant right. subject uh, in this continent and elsewhere tells you already this is an amazing success in a, less than a month. But I think it's very important in these discussions that go on, which are necessary, absolutely necessary, that 
we not, the occupiers do not make the mistake of thinking that everyone in the country is like them down the line. I, I completely agree that people are estranged from the political as well as the uh, Wall Street domination. However, I, I think it's fair to say that there are many more people in what I would call the outer movement, the, those who joined what Betsy described as the march of unions and community groups and so on. There are many more people who actually want to stay in their homes than want to move to the park. I mean, I'll put that just as a symbolic statement of what's in play here. Most people want, like, move on, adopted as its slogan something about restoring the American dream. Most people want the American dream, which is not the same as the dream of, or not certainly not identical to the dream of the people in the park. They want suburban houses, separate, individualized, consumerist. They don't want to stop consumption. They're angry that they've been deprived of the ability to consume. And I'm not saying that they're right or wrong. I'm just making an appraisal of the state of play. These are some of the players in the situation. I think there are many players in the situation. I think that underestimates how widely this movement is resonating in the, into the mainstream. I mean, the poll that Betsy cited about the Occupy movement being twice as popular, having twice the public support as the Tea Party tells us that. I think that undoubtedly there are all kinds of constituencies where a movement like this hasn't yet reached. But when they raise these issues of economic equality, of political corruption, of foreclosures, of bad education, of poor housing, of racism in society, and so on. I think that's having a resonance that we should not underestimate. Janet, you want to follow up? May yeah, I, just I mean, I think, I think, I think Todd has stand, a point. Stand by, Todd. Uh, Janet, but, then Todd. Yeah, I think Todd has a point uh, that's important to recognize. But I also want to say that... The point meaning that most people want to stay home. Well, I think that there, we can't assume that, that this automatically reflects the 99%. <clears throat> okay, I think that's fair to say. But what I think is very interesting is that the occupiers, the activists, are resolutely non-sectarian. They're anti-sectarian. They're making a very, very majoritarian, uh, populist kind of appeal. They um, think that they represent, actually, um, the common good. Yes. Right? They're making a very strong appeal on that basis. And uh, they're not claiming to represent anybody. In fact, they're anti making those kinds of claims. But they are saying that what they are concerned about is about the common good and about a common future and the possibility of a common future. Um, so I think the, uh, and I agree with David, that there is very, like there's a lot of evidence of a lot of resonance. But there's also, there's a, there's a lot of plurality within this movement, uh, which is to be expected. And it's part of its richness. And it's part of, I mean, its unwillingness to uh, prematurely identify demands allows for a great kind of pluralism and a great convergence of many different kinds of discourses and many different kinds of demands to kind of come together and find themselves under now what is this uh, very unifying banner, uh, but allowing many kinds of activisms and indeed many kinds of political dispositions, including different political positions vis-a-vis -vis Congress, vis-a-vis -vis the existence of parties, etc. Let me just say one other thing about the revolution question. Um, I think that the heart of the Occupy movement is a critique of the dominant civilization in that it's raising very profound questions about a productivist society, about a militaristic society, about American uh, in, advent, imperial you're, adventures you're in the world. You're anticipating chapter three of our discussion, oh, and we're okay. not there yet. We're only at chapter two, so stand by. <laughs> so that's I don't to come. think it's revolution in the traditional sense, stand but there's by. something that's to very come. Todd, I know you wanted to get in there with something before I move on. Yeah, a year ago, the Tea Party was uh, identified with by 40% of American voters. Today, it's 20%. Why did it fall in half? I think largely because people had del largely delusional ideas about how the Tea Party spoke for them. And then when the Tea Party got some power and they saw what was actually going on here, what they saw was a right-wing Republican movement mm -hmm. with its traditional bugaboos. And, you know, they didn't like it so much. Only half of them like it. So the caution here is that, you know, people may love what the movement is doing now, but they may not, they're not guaranteed to love it in a year. And doing politics, whether it's revolutionary politics or not, means thinking ahead of the game. We do this, they do that, then what happens? Not simply, we know the truth. Now, you know, it's not a small thing. 
that many people uh, uh, identify with a 99 percent, and I don't think it's necessarily important at all that there be a common set of demands from the occupations. But you know, I do think it's important that everybody acting in this situation be mindful of a scenario to actually win, and having pure desires isn't enough. You, you, you're tis tisking here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, all right, let's so hear from Kobe, Kobe and then we'll hear what the tis tiskers in the studio have to say about that. Go ahead, Kobe. <laughs> With all the respect to everybody, and I truly, um, you know, I'm just 30 and, and you all have much more experience than me. I don't yeah, feel you, you get in the spirit of the movement. We are a little bit behind the, this discussion, <clears throat> at least uh, the conversation that I'm involved in. Uh, we believe that it has to be a radical change in every aspect in society to face the problem that we're going to face. If it's the global shift in power that is extremely uh, obvious, if it's the, the change in behavior to, uh, to start to uh, uh, tackle the climate change and the environment, environment issue and find solution for that, not necessarily from the government. If there is, the government is not responsive, we the people need to find solution. And there's many solutions, I can give you an example later, of uh, just one working group finding ways to uh, use the sun in uh, developing software, software where to analyze the light in every window in the house, and then the computer will tell you what vegetables you can put in that window. We're talking about serious solution to the, the problem we face in humanity right now. So it's a little bit uh, political, but much more than that. Okay, Janet, why the I head shake and the tisk tisk? Well, I just think that persistently focusing on the question of winning or on the question of success is, is setting this up uh, in the wrong way, that this movement is about some more profound socio-cultural change. You. And that to, to be you know, persistently trying to squash it into politics as usual really risks misrepresenting it. The problem and is I we think have in North America politics as usual and media as usual, and they're the ones who will frame this thing. Right. They, well, they no, that to. is not true, in fact, no? because the media has been so far behind on this. I mean, it's the activists in New York and elsewhere that they are creating the discourses about this that the media is, has come along very late in the game and is trying to pick up on. Well, that's and that's why we're having this discussion, that there's yeah. such misunderstanding, I think, of what's going on. David? There. Well, the media kept trying to fit it into all of its known slots. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to look like yeah. this to get press. You have to look like this Thank for us you. to take you seriously. But in fact, this movement, through its creativity and through its inventiveness, basically said, we're going to do it our way. And if we can generate momentum and a wider public understanding, we will become a story that you have to reflect. But we're not going to do it the way you want, with sound bites and or, old, the old style press Thank releases you. and so on. And that's something, the fact that the media doesn't get it doesn't make it illegitimate. Mm -hmm. It simply says that there's something new going on. There's a new language of politics. There's a new style of politics. And the media better figure it and out. And the media is going to have to yeah. figure it out because you know what? It's going. Okay. It's, it's so having a resonance in the mainstream right. anyway. Yeah. Kobe, let yeah. me put this question to you, if I can. You know, the Tea Party started, and it was a very apolitical thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. But then the Republicans saw something and tried, many of them anyway, Tom tried to hop aboard that train. And we're seeing the same thing here. There are some rather large unions that are trying to associate themselves now with your movement. Uh, there are some members of the Democratic Party that are trying to now associate themselves with Occupy Wall Street. What do you think about that? I think it's part of the problem because uh, when they see opportunity, they, we become in a commodity. We can become in just people for voting and then they can continue with their own uh, agendas. Uh, it's remind me, I mean, I'm, it's my own personal view, it reminds me that the, the corporation look at the, the numbers and look just in the quarterly figures. They're not looking at the human being behind the work. Uh, I'm, I believe we need everybody on board, to be honest. We want to uh, non-violently transform society. We need all of, all of them, but we don't want people to come in, which is happening right now. The organizers, coordinate organizers from other movement coming in and trying to push the movement toward their, their agenda. What's beautiful about it is that. Why don't they have the right that, to do that? Sorry, Todd, they say do again? have the right. I'm sorry. They do have Why the don't right. they have the right to do that if it's an open democratic they, movement? They do have the right 100%. This is what I'm trying to clarify. But it's a leaderless movement. So when I'm coming and I'm a one person voice, that's wonderful. But if I'm coming and I'm getting uh, my comments from the office of an, another movement, that is not democratic. 
Uh, oh, it is democratic. Sorry. One second. Is it, it is democratic, I'm sorry. but we want transparency. If somebody engage with us, just let us know that you are organizer for another movement, okay. and then we can have awesome uh, collaboration. Okay, Todd, your turn. Uh, fair enough. I, I agree with that. But the march that Betsy described on October 5th consisted mm -hmm. largely of people turned out by unions, by move on and by professional groups, student groups, right. others. They identified themselves. They had their signs. They had concrete demands. That was actually the bulk. I, I would call that the outer movement. And it's actually much larger. It's more numerous than the inner mm -hmm. movement. I would love now those people. Those people. Um, you know, there may well be lots of arguments about tax. You know, tax financial transaction, tax this, tax that, and so on. But they are also part of the movement that, and a movement to win, whether it's whether it takes electoral politics seriously or not, can't simply represent the most romantic ideas, as noble and beautiful as they are, of the people in the parks. Uh, I've got that, a minute left here. And Co yeah. Yes, C Kobe, if you would. I've got Can a minute left here, and I'd like yeah. you to speak to what, yes. what success would All look right. like for your movement. So, so just let me try to answer. We are part of hundreds of different movements that, that uh, the basis the value and principle based are what uh, bring us together. We have different strategies. Everybody is welcome, the union, move on in every party. I just want to be clear about it. Mm -hmm. um, and success will be when we will have uh, people on the street and, and they're shaking uh, the structures that exist in and having a serious social challenge uh, to the existing institution until they are changing. Uh, and I, I, again, I think it's a lifetime, it's a gener generational thing. I don't think it's a one month or one year. I hope that this movement will build and change society in a way that it builds in society. So when we have such a problem, we can be responsive and, and tackle them in a collective way. Okay. I want to thank all our guests for coming on the program today and having this discussion about this fascinating new phenomenon. Starting with Todd Gitlin, the professor of journalism and sociology at Columbia University, Betsy Reed, executive editor of The Nation in one of our studios in New York, Kobe Skolnick. Occupy Wall Street protesters in our other, Todaraba. Also, Janet Conway, back here in our studio in Toronto from Brock University. David McNally, a professor of political science, York University. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, a conversation on the indigenous rights movement, Idle No More. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.